Good morning, good evening, good night, NBN, Entrepreneurship and Leadership. Personally, I'm fascinated by the story. Trust is an underrated weapon in the business landscape. I'm a really, really strong believer in learning by doing. What's the definition of success? He's trying to come up with an answer to the question. But go ahead, Richard. Uh, you could be right, but you're wrong. <laughs> good morning, good evening, good night, entrepreneurship and leadership listeners on the NBN channel. We have today a very special guest, Robin Bennett, and I'm here together with my co-host, Kimon Fontakidis. Um, Robin, would you like to just introduce yourself in a few words to someone, despite your considerable fame, to someone who's never heard of you? <laughs> um, yes, of course. Um, my name is Robin Bennett, and I, um, I suppose I do call myself an entrepreneur occasionally, um, uh, because now I think you're, you're allowed to say you're an entrepreneur, uh, and uh, people don't, uh, don't think badly of you. Uh, I have started and run, I suppose, over a dozen businesses since about 1992. And I specialize in low cost, um, high growth uh, business startups. That's, that's my thing. Great. Um, well, I mean, Kimon and I are both, although we're in business together, we also have done things separately. Um, are both bootstrappers, so we picked up on low cost. At least I picked up on low cost right away. So, so you're not a sort of rent, rent a flashy office and get lots of expensive furniture as the first step in starting a business. No, I like expensive furniture, though, and I do like flashy offices, uh, but uh, but they sort of come organically. Um, the um, my sort of core business, if you like, is translation, uh, and I've got three translation companies which. Um, was started in sort of 1992, about 1998 and 2000, respectively, and <coughs> they've all grown organically, and they've all they've all paid their way. Um, so you know, but but yes, I do eventually, quite quickly. Um, I do like to have a flashy office somewhere or somewhere nice to work. Anyway, I'm I'm, I'm into that. <laughs> So how'd you get, maybe we just go back a little bit into like, how did you get started? Like, so you said 1992, that's like, whoa, what is that? Are we 30? That's actually exactly 30 years ago. It's 30 years ago. Yeah. So uh, what were you doing? Like, where were you 30 years ago? And then what happened? <laughs> I, I, my first job, my only job, actually, uh, I, I walked into, I walked into the wrong room. Um, I went for an interview in a uh, jazz music magazine in Soho. Uh, called Jazz Express, and I walked into an office on the first floor instead of the second floor of Kettner's in Soho, and met Peter Boizo, who founded Pizza Express, um, mm -hmm. and he immediately sort of latched on to the fact that I walked into the wrong room, which he thought was hilarious, um, <laughs> and gave me a job, <laughs> and uh, I worked for him for a year, and I learned a lot. I learned an awful lot. He was uh, Peter Boizo was an old style entrepreneur. Very much so. Uh, you know, Pizza Express was just one of the things that he did. Can you, but please, please, just for, for me personally, but I think also for everybody, what does that mean? Like, can you describe what an old style entrepreneur means? To you? I think they're sort of more swashbuckling. Again, which goes back to this sort of has to pay its way. I think he started selling those, you know, those tiny little sort of greasy slices of pizza you get in the West End of London sometimes when you sort of, when you walk out of the pub. Um, and he started by selling those and sort of just grew from there. Um, but he would always push the envelope. So however big he got, he would always then go a stage further, you know, sort of this thing about not resting on your laurels, which I think is very good and sort of not really, um, it's quite irresponsible when you think about it, but it's not, you know, he never really kind of shored himself up and secured himself and then moved on to the next thing. He would just go, Oh, I've got X amount of money. I'm going to spend it all on something else, um, and then see where the chips sort of fall. Um, and you've got to respect him because I think when I joined him, he was massively in debt. Pizza Express was hugely overextended, um, and he was looking at losing. So it was just a ridiculous sort of amount of money. Sort of a million pounds a month was sort of being lost, um, and he didn't panic. Um, and he managed to somehow float the company off the back of a defunct computer firm. And I think by the time I left, he was worth over 60 million. So it's just an extraordinary, you know, I, I, I have to admire people like that. I, I'm much more cautious than that in my approach. Um, yeah. And I'm just, just for a bit of context, uh, 
Pizza Express is a major British chain and Soho is a fashionable district in London. And I guess you're talking in terms of pounds rather than swati or rubles, because a lot of our listeners aren't in the UK. Yes, of course. Yes, sorry. I'll, 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 I'll convert when, when I mention figures again. Um, but, um, but yes, to go back to how I started, I, I found as much as I learned with him, I didn't really enjoy working with somebody. I didn't really, I found it quite stressful to have someone else's expectations on me rather than my own. Um, and I, I more or less got into translation by mistake. The first company I started was London Tutors, which was a home tuition company. And within the sort of the context of that, we, we did a little bit of um, language training for companies. And then one day somebody came to me and said, um, we, you know, learning a language, Robin, is really difficult. Um, could you just translate this for us? Uh, to which I said, who never translated anything in my life, I just sort of said, of course. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> why not? You do it all the time. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> and we, and, and I it just gave me an idea. So I, I did that old fashioned thing the next day. I thought, well, maybe there's something in translation. And I hit the phones the next day, just literally phoning. I think I, trans I looked at hospitals and marketing companies and I just rang around companies in West London specifically um, and I think the second call I made and this was just just unbelievably lucky um, the second call I made was a marketing company who just won the contract for the launch of Jurassic Park in 13 different territories oh my and goodness. they pretty much gave us the contract straight away oh my god I love this story there's a good there's a classic lesson there, isn't there, that on the one hand, you were incredibly lucky. On the other hand, you were on the phone call calling people. So you created a context in which luck could happen. Yes. And, and I'm, I'm, still a be, I'm still a massive believer in picking up the phone, um, not emailing, emailing people or not writing people letters necessarily. Um, I, think, I think picking up the phone, there's a sort of an alchemy there. Some things happen when you talk to people. Um, and and sometimes it's bad. Sometimes they're rude to you, and sometimes uh, they're not. And I think if you're honest with people, um, I think the worst type of cold calling is when you, you don't explain to people why you're calling, and you start by asking them about their children or if they're having a nice day um, and things like that. And it just never works. You know? uh, but if you if you're totally upfront uh, with why you're calling from the word go. Um, find you get a better response. I'd like to go back to the opportunity though, because I don't think it's only luck, Richard. Actually, I think there's also stupidity on the client side. <laughs> like, like literally, <laughs> you, can you imagine giving this huge important contract to some guy that just called you up? <laughs> like there's no like, Richard, oh, that's convenient. You do translation, oh, that's convenient. I actually have a huge translation, but here you go. <laughs> that, that was and that was totally it. I, I I went to the meeting, so we arranged to meet. But actually, before I'd walked into the meeting, they decided that yeah. I should save them a huge amount of time and effort. Of course, finding a translation company. This is I, a big problem. For, this is a big problem they had, yeah. and you just yeah. sort, sorted it for them. And there was yeah. this guy who was and just over the river. Yes, just over the River Thames from them, and and so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, Robin, maybe to give a bit of context, I mean, I can tell immediately, as although I'm a Polish citizen now, I grew up in the UK in a sort of middle class public school background. You sound like a respectable sort of person to native English ears and possibly, do you think part of it, could you talk a bit about your background before you were looking for that job? And when you were a teenager or a kid, did you imagine you might have your own business? And were you sort of, or were your parents pushing in that direction? Or were they a bit shocked and stunned that you didn't want to be a civil servant? <laughs> or join the army, I was due to join the army actually. I was two weeks away from uh, becoming cavalry officer, um, which is quite posh. Uh, and I decided that wasn't for me. So I had to pay an awful lot of money back to the government. Uh, but I decided that being in charge of a tank was a very, very bad idea. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I didn't, but no, it's, and in fact, it's an extremely good question. Um, so we were, I do come from a sort of an upper middle class and background, um, but we were very poor. I grew up on a, a council estate in Reading. Um, so we were posh, but poor, um, which in the 1970s is not fun. Um, 
uh, <laughs> we were kind of walking around in white Aaron sweaters when everyone else had skinny Adidas t-shirts um, and, uh, and matching brown shoes. Um, and we just didn't sound like we should have fitted within the, um, within the whole sort of environment, sort of slightly dodgier part of Reading uh, in 1973. Then my parents scraped enough money to send my brother and I to a small failing boarding school in Oxfordshire. Um, and, and I think that is where it started. I think this, this drive, I think this, this fire in your belly started there because being poor in an environment where there are a lot of kids who have a lot of money, um, uh, which the British public school system had. So there were kids that had all their Atari systems and they flew places and holidays and so And I was in, you know, I, my brother and I were no extras, no trips, school trips, nothing which would cost any extra money. Uh, we were still wearing bell bottoms again when everyone was in drain pipes, uh, hand me downs. Um, think, think Ron Weasley, <laughs> think. Uh, in Harry Potter, that's more or less what we were. Um, and I didn't really mind it, but it did give me a determination to sort of, it gave me something to aim at because I could see these families that were very wealthy, that, that didn't have to worry about money, that whose parents weren't telling them at the end of every term, this could be your last term in this, this school. Um, and, uh, and so that's a very good question. Yeah, this comes. But and, and in terms of your, I'm sorry, but just to, in terms of, you know, I, I would say I had a, that rush of light that my parents definitely weren't as hard up as that. But, you know, I was at Winchester College and the other kids were, there was a group of us who didn't come from money backgrounds and we all kept quiet about it and pretended, pretended that we were perfectly well off when we weren't. But it was a very powerful driver not to live like my parents for me. And it wasn't, it wasn't that I wanted lots of stuff, I just didn't want that stress. Uh, of having to worry about money all the time was my was my goal uh, financially. But um, did they have in mind some future for you? you I mean, like, were they were, were you sort of brought up with the sense of parental expectation that now we've made this massive sacrifice for you? Now you go and be X or Y, or were they quite good about it and let you go off in your own direction? No, I think they were. Quite, I think they couldn't help themselves. Um, I think you know that would have required a level of discretion that was almost superhuman because money really was incredibly tight. Um, and, and I think that it wasn't until, so they did, they, they did fret and they did sort of, I did get quite a lot of lectures about, you know, make sure you turn up to all your lessons um, and, and, and do well, uh, which of course I ignored uh, mainly um, and just did my own thing. Uh, and, but it, it I mean, it, it, it wasn't the worst thing in the world. Um, and like you say, kids are very good at pretending um, that they fit in anyway, which is also, that's another skill. I think, uh, I think a, a good sales skill to have is to be able to read your audience and to fit with, with, with their expectations of you and their expectations of what you can provide for them uh, is, is useful. If you're too rigid, if you're too sort of square cut, about everything, you know, this is what we do, we don't do anything else, and this is who I am, and you just have to accept it. Um, it might be quite laudable, as a, it might be quite an honorable course, but actually from a sales point of view, from a marketing point of view, it's probably not the most efficient. When you were a kid or young, often we find when we talk to entrepreneurs, did you do, was there anything entrepreneurial in your childhood, like selling sweets or, I don't know, like any, any kind of random thing that you were, or hustling, because when I'm listening to you, or even I'm thinking, yeah, this guy, this, that, that childhood, whatever that upbringing leads to grit and determination, the kind of things that actually matter for an entrepreneur that you're not, that you weren't just given it all, that you had to like earn it. Um, was there any kind of stories like that or anything like that, that in the, in the, in the, in the whatever formative years or early on that? I, I was remarkably, um, unentrepreneurial, even, even <laughs> right up to university. I, I was, uh, I wanted to join the army. I wanted to be a right. soldier. That's the opposite, exactly. Give me discipline, yeah. tell me what to do. <clears throat> yeah. Right. I, I wanted to be a soldier, I, you know, and, and I, I, I didn't really begin to think about it until I got to university. And then, and that's when I started my first business. And that's when I 
sort of thought, I, that's when I began to sort of think about doing things on my own. So I, I, I tweaked that uh, in the first year at university, I sort of, I ran out of money probably like a lot of people quite quickly. <laughs> um, and, and I tweaked that there are an awful lot of people in the, in the halls of residence who never left their room. You know, they, you just didn't see them in the repertory. You never saw them in the dining room. You never saw them, you know. Okay. And I think there are a lot of people that would do almost anything not to go into those public spaces at university. And so we, myself and my girlfriend at the time, we went down to, um, we went down to, I can't remember which supermarket it was, and we bought a chicken and we bought some iceberg lettuce. We bought some bread. Um, and... And then we started making sandwiches and I started sending admittedly pretty girls around to people's room to sell <laughs> sandwiches for one pound only, one pound only a sandwich, which was a bit another sort of big draw. But we could make, you could make sort of 60p on a sandwich easily. Um, and we used to find that by the time neighbours came on at lunchtime, we, we'd made enough really for, you know, for all of us to do, to do quite well. Um, where that was, where, where, was it, where, where, did, where did where did that idea come from? Because I mean, this is a crazy thing that if you look at how much someone will make for working in a pub or a cafe, you were probably like making far more money than that just by doing something as simple as making sandwiches. And where did that idea come from? Do you remember someone? Was it you or did someone say? Because it's I mean it's quite sort of like out of the blue. It's not like and it is so obvious, and yet no one does it. There's probably someone listening to this right now who might be able to make that opportunity. I suppose it's Uber Eats now and everything. But... Oh, I hope so, yeah. No, that, if somebody's listening and they think, you know, I'm a student and I could do that. It was actually because, it was my idea, but it wasn't a great idea in the sense that it wasn't amaz an amazing leap. It was literally just this observation that people didn't leave their rooms. So if you brought food to them. And also the fact that there was a whole kitchen right opposite my room, which no one ever used, actually. It was just, it was... No one actually left food there, no one prepared food there, no one did anything. So I did think there was a space. But the telling thing about it, then when the summer came along, we stole a shopping trolley and sliced it up and turned it into a mobile barbecue. Um, and then what, but what is really interesting was one of my best friends saw what we were doing and made the barbecue then a fixed barbecue and more or less took over from me. And from the mixed, fixed barbecue, he then, that we did outside the halls of residence, he then identified a space in the halls of residence, which was empty, went to Courage Brewery in England and got them to fit out a pub called the Stumble Inn. And so I was meeting people who were thinking much bigger than me, even <laughs> then. And that's really interesting. There's always somebody who's thinking one step ahead. And Mel, he became managing director of Reed um, quite quickly after leaving university. Uh, and, and there's a reason for that because he was just so, we were just doing sandwiches and, and sort of jolly wheeze of shopping, you know, cutting room. shopping trolley and, yeah. you know. Uh, and, and that's a huge, uh, that's a huge, I mean, if you think about the McDonald's Ray Kroc and the McDonald's brother, I mean, even at the scale that, you know, the McDonald's were up and running, but it was Ray Kroc who saw that what they were doing had the potential to be a, a massive business. And, you know, very, you know, it wasn't that they were just like students making sandwiches. They already had their, their operation up and running. So looking for the opportunity in someone else's idea is, is a very good thing to take away. If you take away that one idea from this podcast, that's a lot, apart from making sandwiches and selling it in all the residents. Yes. Yeah. A little bit to that. So was it part, because were they shocked? Why were they not going out? Were they shy or were they, they didn't yeah. like the food? They, shy, mostly shy? I say? think they were mostly shy. I think there, there would seem to be a lot of people in halls who you just never saw. You, you always used to see the same faces propping up the bar. Um, you'd always see the same people sort of getting out of the bar. I think and, it's, rem yeah, it's remarkable because I have a very similar story. When I was in college, I sold t-shirts. They were like, cool. They were like bong, like connected to like marijuana. They're like bong team t-shirts. And I would go door to door with my friends and it was the same thing. It was like, you were, so you were bringing food. I was bringing coolness to the, to the <laughs> But like, it was like for the people that didn't leave, that didn't do the bomb in real life, they had the bomb shirt. Anyway, but it's like, the, 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 that's really interesting that you, and then that you, you actually send the girls up and all that, that that's, uh, that's, because that I can imagine it working actually. I mean, basically, it's like it's a very similar story, but I can imagine it working. It's like you've hit 
like the shyness, it's at yeah. my door, the convenience. So a lot, there's a lot there. And, then, uh, and, and, and there's also another lesson which is probably relevant to 2022 when we're recording this, if you're listening in 2032 <laughs> or, or 2132, that a lot of social media is about people pretending the world is that they are different from how they really are and the world is different from how they really are so a lot of people will probably be very different from the way the world is presented to you if you just sit, you sit looking at your screen so spotting the gap between reality and the way people think reality is can be an opportunity in and of itself that there are quite big differences between what you think is going on and what's really going on very often Yes. Yeah. And back then, I mean, I think I, I, Robin and I were doing this like at exactly the same time. So like back then, there was no internet. There was no, you were, they were, I don't know what the people were doing in the room. I am, I am, I am, I am the same age. I, I, I am the same age as you guys. More. <laughs> like I'm aware of that. <laughs> I was always quite surprised though. People's rooms were always um, a lot cosier than mine. Um, and this is my recording school thing, but people had scatter cushions and and yeah. and kind of little mini tvs and 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 you know and, and things like that and and their own rugs um <laughs> and, uh, mine pretty much looked like the same as when i moved in um and uh, just had a few books in it uh the um, but yeah it 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 was it was purely temporary though and i think you know because sooner or later the college authorities were going to twig we were essentially running a business out of a college kitchen that had a food, health, hygiene, safety <laughs> element to it. Um, and so we, we definitely felt we were on borrowed time, hence the barbecue idea um, and, uh, and doing it outside. Um, and then, but then I think we were again illegal because we started selling beer with the barbecue. Um, and, uh, and, and again, as I say, that's where Mel stepped in and thought, well, look, there's this huge space behind us, which never gets used. Uh, and uh, it's called the Stumble Inn, and it still exists at Royal Holloway uh, University of London, um, or it still existed when I last looked at it. Um, but uh, but yes. And then so, going forward, was there after the sandwiches and the barbecue? Was there anything else in college that you did? Was there anything else? No. Uh, then I was remarkably quiet. Actually, then I just sort of you know uh, I I did a lot of things for my first year, and then things got sort of busier. Then I did do. Instead of doing, I, I studied modern languages, probably like you, um, at university, and, and I had a third year that I had to spend in France. Um, and I did opt, instead of doing, a, which is ironic now, instead of doing, I think, a translation course in Paris, <laughs> um, I opted, I found myself a marketing course in Bordeaux. Um, and... Um, I used some. What of drove that decision? I, you know, I, I don't. Nobody had mentioned really translation. I, this is odd, considering I was doing modern languages. No one mentioned in the entire four years I was at Royal Holloway translation as a career. Um, we were always told about sort of marketing, or we were told about um, teaching, or and I thought I didn't really necessarily want to teach. So I thought, well, I. I'll get some marketing experience under my belt. If if marketing is what you do with your with your modern languages degree, um, I'll find out about that. And uh, and that was fascinating. That that was that was uh, yeah. Having spent so many years just discussing symbolism in Proust and and um, you know what Sartre meant by existentialism, it was really nice to sort of then suddenly find myself discussing you know. Um, uh, USPs and 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 you know whether your distribution costs might be too high um, and things like that. It was just yeah, it was just a nice counterpoint. And also, I mean, that so was that your first opportunity to we then I guess you were living abroad and I and, and that was good for your language. You learned French, I guess, really well. But was it in French? Was it in? Uh... Yeah, it was in French. I did. I think the course was French, German, and English. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, it was sort of a general sort of marketing. Uh, call it, they called it a BTS, um, and uh, and they they they're, they're very good. I think that's one thing they do in France very well. Are these um, uh, sort of quite um, quite um, concertina, quite concentrated, very practical courses mm -hmm. for people who don't necessarily want to spend three years at university. 
So you had the marketing under your belt? Yeah. Um, didn't think I was going to, still thought I was going to join the army. Um, the uh, army was always there. It was always there. I mean, they, <laughs> they, they were giving me money. That was the problem. They, they wow. spoke to the university, so they weren't giving me some money. But the, the uh, you know, and, and it wasn't really until uh, two weeks before my finals, I just thought it wasn't such a great idea. But you know, then, then I think the next real stepping stone for me was again driven by money and again driven by the fact that um, in the early 90s in the UK for people who aren't from the UK was not a fun time uh, economically or it was not a fun time to be a graduate. There was, there was a pretty nasty recession on, there were no graduate jobs um, and, and I did have a job prior to working with Beach Boys, so essentially it wasn't a job. Um, it was a no pay commission only door to door sales job um, in Yorkshire uh, selling. I don't know whether you guys have had someone bang on your door selling an aerial picture of your, your house. Um, and so I spent a summer sort of just banging on people's doors saying, hello, have you ever seen your house at 4,000 feet? Um, and getting people to buy an aerial picture of their house, um, which was tough. A bit good training and quite good fun. I think that's I I I am a big believer in that um, door to door sales. I mean, like I don't it doesn't exist, and I guess it doesn't even exist anymore. But uh, like, talk about old school hardcore boot camp sales training. I mean, mm -hmm. nothing like meeting a human face to face and trying to convince them to spend money on something. I mean, it's it's <sighs> really it's a really good experience. I mean, like it, I think it's a really valuable experience actually. And, but you know, and it weeds out. It's not easy. It's I mean, whatever you said, you obviously have some basic skills because it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, you wouldn't last for two for a day. If you no, they 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 kind of they were very good actually. They they kind of they gave us a two day maybe three day training course. In okay, these are the selling points. These are the things you have to go for. Yeah. Just... So they literally just taught us. This is how you go in. This is how you answer objections. This is how you price build up and. Absolutely essential. And I suppose this is the one thing I really learned is close, 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 always close. Never, never take the, oh, I'm just going to think about it. Come back tomorrow. Um, sort of <laughs> Alec, thing. Alec, Ball, Alec Baldwin, always be closing. ABC, always be closing, right? That's the, um, no, that, that's amazing. That's amazing. And, and also, I'm mean, flipping onto the present, presumably having had those sort of experiences when you're a bit younger, it makes you a better leader when you're hiring people because you've done the tough stuff yourself. It's one thing for a sort of theoretical MBA type person who's been, worked at McKinsey to tell people to do tough things. But if you've done it yourself, you know it. A, you know in your core it's possible if someone's motivated, and B, they respect you because they hear that you did it yourself. Yes. I, think it develops, I think it develops what I call a good bullshit detector. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> when yes, you later hire a salesperson, if you later hire a salesperson, your bullshit detector is very finely tuned to, to, to that, basically, because you've done something really hard in sales, basically. Over the years, that's one thing I did notice. I, I, I used to, I then got very, when, when I started in translation, we effectively turned ourselves into a telesales outfit. Um, so I had about six people just hitting the phones every day. Um, and only about two project managers because we were still <laughs> building up <laughs> the most ridiculously lopsided business. That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, also you had that uh, gold mine in your second call. So I think you believed heavily in that assembly in this telephone thing, it's gonna break. <laughs> That's right. I mean, but I, I, did, I did stop hiring professional salespeople because I found they were far too, and I'm sorry to professional salespeople who are sort of listening, but I found they were, they, day one, they wanted to know about the commission rates and the commission structures, and they immediately wanted to gear it to their, you know, that's their, their job at the end of the day. They wanted to earn as much money. Whereas I found that if I just got people who weren't very salesy, and actually, I think people react quite well to people who are quite unsalesy anyway, mm -hmm. um, uh, that they, they, they just wanted to do a good job, you know, they didn't sort of, and we could train them then into what we needed uh, them to say, to sort of get us in front of people so that we could sell them translation. Okay. Uh, but it, uh, it, it, yeah, uh, 
definitely the bullshit detector thing is a very good thing. It's a very useful thing. But mm. if, have you, well, maybe then you can talk a little bit because I'm curious how you grew it or how it, so like, yeah, you had the telesale, you had the lopsided telesales to project manager ratio. And then um, how did you, uh, I don't know, how'd you grow it up? I mean, it's and like, I guess that you were, they were setting up, at that point, they were setting up meetings for you to, to actually do the real close. Is that how like you would go in and like actually do the real closing? But maybe just talk us through, and then like, you said, yeah, also, I don't want, we don't only have to focus on translation. I mean, you said you had m multiple businesses. So maybe you could just keep taking us through the. Okay, yeah. The, so, the, um, the translation was the core one after London. London Tutors was a home tuition agency in, in London, providing home tuition to families or to people who just wanted extra help in their, their GCSE physics or whatever. Um, but it could never, I, I could see very quickly it get very limited. We very quickly we became the largest agency in London and we still weren't making a great deal of money. Whereas every time we took on a translation job, like the Jurassic Park thing, we were making real proper money that allowed us to hire people and, and, and not fret about whether we needed to buy a computer or whatever. So I started concentrating more and more on that. Um, the, how we grew that was badly. To begin with, <laughs> we did it. We, I made every mistake. I'm not saying we, we, I, <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes. Um, and the worst one was we grew far too quickly. And I think huh? from 1992 to 1997, by about 1997, um, we were taking on a lot of automotive and a lot of plastics, quite high tech translation work, and we weren't very good. I don't think we went, we suddenly hit a point between 97 and 2000. We started doing our automotive um, and IP work. And we, and we were all constantly firefighting. We were constantly delivering projects at the very last minute. We weren't quality controlling until the last minute. Um, we, were, we were running our, the accounting function was poor. We had lots of late payers. Um, I would get VAT bills in and yeah, panic attacks, um, you know. And then other months we were making more money than I knew what to do with, you know, and it was just, and it, but it was an awful scenario. It was sort of this horrible kind of like, you know, feast and famine and, and nothing, nothing was gelling at all. And, and, and actually in 2001, 2002, my wife and I went off to Australia for three months and I had a really, really good think about the business. I had a really good think about the stress <laughs> levels. And, and yeah, it was lovely to go to Australia. It was lovely to be able to afford to stay in the best places and, and go to nice, you know, beaches and things like that. And, and I knew that was one of the upsides, but the other upside, downside was having this, this weight, you know, on my shoulders of this company that, you know, they were client complaints or there were staff getting stressed out or there was but you were able to go away for three months so already there is a success in there you just to be able to go away for three months or were you managing the business remotely for i was managing the business remotely and it wasn't actually a good idea because actually the, uh, one of our <laughs> worst things that we did was me going away for three months i took my eye off the financial ball on an eu contract that we had at the time and it wasn't until about a year later, I came back and I found, when, whilst going through some old invoices, I found that we've been charging the absolute minimum rate, regardless of the language, regardless of the lead time, regardless of everything. So we were making so much less money than we should have been making. And I only found that out six, seven months later because I was I delegated too much of the business too quickly. Um, to people and I learned actually from that you can delegate things but in stages and you always need a second pair of eyes when you delegate you always need I would say that, that this is a really interesting for me because I would say that's the biggest flaw for entrepreneurs actually the biggest is the bottleneck and the non-delegating and it has I have to do it myself it's so rare that you hear somebody that they over delegate like it's just that is it, it, that, in my opinion that is the biggest yeah sort of limit, limiter for entrepreneurs is that they feel that they need to do it all themselves. They're the only people that can do it right. And they just can't. And like, that's just, I just think it's really interesting that he actually, you actually went the other way. He actually over-delegated too early. 
It's interesting. Yeah, no, I think it, it was a mistake, but we just needed to tweak it. Um, you know, you, you do need to delegate. I mean, now, you know, I, I maybe, uh, the business takes an hour of my day. Exactly. Yeah, um, and, and, and for the last 10 years, we've had a really, really good team. You know, if you're listening, you didn't say it's been, can you get a sense of the scale of the business so you have hundreds of people thousands of people are you in the tens of millions or hundreds of millions just like right now in oh, terms okay. of your total your total business because you know you could be like a highly successful person with eight people and you're living comfortably or you could be a billionaire and artists don't yet know <laughs> yes so you no know, we're, we're still talking small business so we 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 have you know seven or eight project managers and that was the same as back when we were sort of running things and being frantic about it we're just better structured now so I have seven or eight project managers at any one time they are running teams of translators um, and I guess we probably got about 150 projects outstanding at any one time so we're small for compared to the big guys in translation um, we're slightly odd, actually, I think, because we're bigger than most of the small guys. Um, we, we sort of sit in that odd middle ground. Um, uh, and again, this was a strategic decision I took after Australia, where we did have the opportunity to become a sort of a word factory, like, you know, some of the bigger guys like SDL, where we were getting these, these automotive contracts. Um, and, and we could have sort of gone the other way and had a room full of 100 project managers um, and been very, very heavily automated and very heavily um, uh, technology driven. Uh, and actually, we decided that we would stick in quite high tech, IP, defense, that kind of area um, and do, do stuff that other people didn't necessarily do or couldn't do. Um, and B, I always liked, uh, am I allowed to mention company names here? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I always admired RWS when I'd, I was sort of growing up because yeah. RWS was the company you went to when everything else was going badly. You know, um, they, uh, Mitaka was the same as well. They, they would always do, you know, they, they would always be the safe pair of hands. And I thought, I want to be that. I want to be, I want for the actual translation group to be that safe pair of hands. Um, and we don't actively want to grow beyond what we're, where we're at. Um, uh, I find in translation, it's very, you can make money up to a certain amount, about 5 million turnover, um, and it's quite easy to run a company. I think there's a very, very difficult bit between 5 and 15 million turnover where you can very easily go bust or you can very easily overextend and things can get quite nasty. Then when you get over that, I'm sure it's, <laughs> it's an amazing place to be. Um, but I, I'm not that person. I'm, I, think I'll, I think to my dying day, I'll be a small company person. Um, <laughs> and, and I like, as I say, you know, you were asking about other businesses. So, you know, publishing, um, uh, I've got a board meeting today at Farfly. So I'm, I'm, I'm a publisher. Um, uh, and before, before you describe those businesses in detail, can you talk a bit about your motivation? I don't know whether it was Australia, but you do these things which aren't really, I suppose you could say publishing and translation to do with sort of wordsmithery in different ways. But what was your motivation to do these other businesses? Because, you know, it's, it's one thing to have them and succeed, which is the, the tricky bit. But it's another thing to actually want to have that situation where you're, you're comfortably enough off to have a three month holiday in Australia for your translation. And yet, hey, I'm going to do a publications business. So before you talk about these other businesses, why did you do these other things as well? What, what, what was the driver for that? I think it's a humdrum thing. I think it's a don't, you know, and it goes back to this nine to five working for somebody else. I didn't, I wanted to feel I was an entrepreneur that I could do, I could still do what I wanted to do. So however, actually inconvenient at times it is to be in Australia at three in the morning and be shouting to a printer, uh, in Wales, um, uh, you know, it's still more fun to do it because you're in Australia and they're not. Um, <laughs> and uh, and <laughs> that sounds really mean, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, but, maybe you are mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But and I suppose that's the thing where you think, well, look, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want the translation business to start feeling like a job because I'm having to do it every day. So, you know, I've done everything. We did um, uh, cigars, um, uh, and and that that sort of fell into my lap actually. Uh, the the funniest one was probably the dog sitting. Uh, the dog kennels. Um, my wife got pregnant in about 2003, 2004, and it wasn't it wasn't good for her to carry on working. Where she was working in an autistic a school for autistic kids, and there was a problem. See, so she was pregnant, and and it yeah. was. And we thought, well, we're living in a nice place that's all enclosed in the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I love dogs. I really, you know, we had a dog, and 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 I'd always. Been Sort of wanted to sort of do something with dogs, and we put an ad out in the Henley Standard. I think it cost me nine ninety nine plus fat, just saying dog sitting. And we sort of made it very clear that we weren't proper kennels or anything like that, and we weren't accredited. But we just said, you know, here's a fire, here's a television. The, our dog loves it here. You know, your dog can come here too. Uh, sort of thing. And it was sort of something for us to do, um, sort of defray the cost of sort of you know then sort of my wife being at home um and i think we made 10 grand in the first year and about 20 grand in the second year it was most ridiculously as an investment it was, it was just an amazing thing and and it was also something just nice to do something different you know you you sort of worry then about you know something that's not to do with your core business and i think that that's quite healthy to have something else to to worry about that might not be that important because it wouldn't have mattered if it hadn't worked out um it was just a fun thing to do. Boredom thing, I, I've gone through that as well. I'm sure other people as well. I mean, I, I you, there's different ways to quell the board. I think it's boredom I, a little bit. I don't know because I think you get, like, if you're an entrepreneur, you tend to like not want to get, like you just were trying to avoid that like regular job. And so like, and then you find yourself, you build a company and you're just doing the same thing every day or whatever. If, if it gets hard or repetitive, then you can like, so I think there's other ways people deal with that in different ways. They try to do new stuff in their business or they try to do other businesses. And I just think it's a hilarious story though. It's like a really good one. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you do, you just, boredom. Boredom is a great driver, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, I've never agreed with that thing that was it the devil makes work for idle hands. No, no. Boredom has been like the number one driver of my entire life. I want to do nothing. <laughs> or boredom sorry that's not boredom laziness sorry, laziness <laughs> laziness has been one of the largest drivers of my life yeah. uh, and keenan is in denial I mean, he's a few months a few years here a three years younger than me but i've known we've been in business since about 2000 and he's been working really hard for 22 years uh, or longer <laughs> saying i want to be lazy and do nothing and you do manage to squeeze quite a lot of laziness in it's not that it's not that you fail but you work pretty hard as well it's not it's both and rather than either or but um so you, so you do the kennels you, how, what about the publish how did you get into publishing well that, that was so i wrote a book in australia i wrote my first book on entrepreneurship um and it was all about uh, Start Up Smart by Harriman from Harriman House. And, and it was all about how to start a business with a very little amount of money and, and earn money from day one. And actually at the time, people weren't interested at all in it um, because it was all about getting a large chunk of money, like you were saying, and, right. and, and, then, and then looking at an exit strategy within five right. years sort of thing. And, but then suddenly in about 2000. By 2006, it suddenly got that sort of low cost, high, you know, high return thing, became sort of popular. And, and so I did my first book and then I did another book for them um, about investment, uh, about alternative investments, you know, everything from gold to stamps to everything else. Um, and- Are you an investor in that kind of stuff? Yes, yeah, so behind that, I suddenly got interested in investing in about 2005, I guess. Um, well, I hadn't owned a share before then. I hadn't mm. been interested in any of that. It, it wasn't on my radar. Well, I hadn't had any money, sort of. <laughs> exactly, that's a key, a key factor. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a, little de a little detail. <laughs> <laughs> Very minor detail. I hadn't got a share to my name because I didn't have any money to buy any. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, but then the whole, uh, the whole side of shares and interested me. Also because... And the book, the second book I wrote for Harriman was Kicking the Property Ladder, 
because I'd never made money like all my friends had in property. I'd never been one of those guys that bought a flat in 1993 um, in London and just suddenly found myself a millionaire one day because um, Southwest London just became popular um, and really, really expensive. Um, and I, I was interested in the whole idea of investment, just sort of, you know, classic investment, but I also, I did a thing a long time ago in about 2004, when, just when Gordon Brown was doing the opposite, I, I, I bought a whole load of gold when it was, no one was buying gold. And it was really one of the stupidest things I'd ever done because I just, and it, you talk about laziness and it was lazy. I couldn't be bothered to research any more <laughs> it's, it's gold it has to be <laughs> <laughs> all my money goes into that that's I just and I don't have to think about it again and there I've been a responsible adult I've invested money it's not sitting in the bank as cash um, and I think that I, and, I, and it, it gold then went up so the story is a happy story uh, mm -hmm. but it did get me interested in alternative investments uh, as well and that's what I sort of wrote about and 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 I, I, I'm less keen on investing now, though. Um, I, I actually, it, I got bored of it quite quickly. And my investments now are probably about as mundane and boring <laughs> and non-swashbuckling as you can possibly imagine. I mean, if you were to look up the split between shares and bonds and commodities, you know, at my age, that would be me. That would be literally, you know, um, so no, I'm very, very dull. Now. What's the most, what, what, what's a weird, non-famous, whatever investments like stamp, like tell us like, I don't know anything about any of these non, whatever, what do you call it? Like non uh, traditional investments or non. Well, yeah. I mean, stamps has been probably one of my best ones, American yeah. stamps. Um, but it's hard to actually realize that, you know, there's a value and then there's a value that somebody will give you the actual money for this stuff. Right, that's what I'm saying. It's Isn't there a hassle around all that stuff? You have to sell it. You actually have to like buy yeah. it and get somebody to, sell, uh, get somebody to buy yeah. it. I mean, Ditto wine. I invested quite heavily in wine that um, I'm far too, I'm far too much of a heathen to actually appreciate. Um, <laughs> and, and I can look at it on the trading platform and and the way I look at it, I'll never see the cash. I'll never drink it. But I think if the children get married, I, you can swap it for all the sparkling wine you can shake a stick at. So that's the wedding sort of thing. Ah, okay. So um, I should do it like that uh, on a sort of trade-off. But yeah, I mean, yeah, that was pro probably wine and stamps as sort of the weirdest thing. Um, I never know about art. I, I like buying pictures. Um, just cheap. I, I bought so many cheap pictures that I like over the years and then sort of moved up. And I don't, again, it's, it, I don't know how you turn that into money, real money. Um, Sounds uh, like a hassle. Think of e there's, a thing, there's a thing called eBay, isn't there? You can just put them on eBay. <laughs> yeah, you can do that, yes. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I just a useful tip in case you haven't <laughs> eBay.co.uk. Um, but you didn't explain how you ended up getting into the publishing business through writing the books, though. So did you self-publish or was it, was it um, what, did you no. buy a publishing company or so? Why I set was, one up? I was very traditionally published. Um, Harriman House are... Uh, again about as traditional as you get and I, I like that whole process if you get somebody lots of people you know your editor there will be nice to you your the PR person will be nice to you and will send you out I went out to lots of universities and spoke about starting businesses to people had an interesting year but I was interested in in it did make me more interested in publishing um, and and subsequently I sort of I didn't really I wasn't necessarily going to write books about business all my life um, so I started writing children's books cool. um, and then I and then I probably I've done almost every permutation from self-publishing to partner publishing to traditional children's publishing since um, and it's something I feel quite strongly about I think um, you know I think all have their benefits self-publishing definitely has benefits I think traditionally publishing is good part of you know they, they're they're all they're all valid um and and I'm interested in all of them I probably shouldn't be saying that now I'm a proper publisher um <laughs> but it's interesting uh, you used to your course of a proper publisher can you just talk about is it Fastlay what what scale is Fastlay at what what, what do you, how many books do you do a year or what's the revenue or number of people 
So we do we do about 14 books a year, Firefly. We have a back, so we're small. So we start, Firefly was started not by me, it was started by Penny and Janet Thomas um, about 10 years ago. Uh, I, I, with my sort of children's writer hat on, I've met um, Penny and Janet over the years and really, really liked what they did. Um, I thought their eye for a good author was phenomenal. Um, uh, I thought their ability to, to turn out beautiful books that children love on an absolutely tiny budget. Um, you know, this is just kitchen sort of budget initially. Um, you know, I think, I think when I was first involved in it, we were looking at sort of 100K turnover, um, if that. Um, uh, and so I could see potential there. Uh, publishing is fascinating because it's so hard to make money. The margins are absolutely minute. Um, uh, it's, it's very, very, it's, it's almost archaic, the number of people, this sort of merry-go-round of agents, authors, um, distributors, reps. Um, there's so many people involved in the process and there's so many people involved in, in, in taking a commission or a royalty out of it, that at the end of it, the author and the publisher and everyone else, they make very little money. And, and it's sort of, it's almost a challenge to see how you can make money. I mean, Farfly has sort of quadrupled in size since the early days. Um, and so did you come in as an invest? Like, what did you do? Did you in, just invest in the company, join as a partner? Or? Uh, I, I started off, I said I'd invest, but then I said I'd work there for a year part-time. I, I, think, I think I rather naively said I'd do two days a month, yeah. um, which is more like two days a week. <laughs> um, and it's one of those things children publishing just reels you in um and and the minute you get your first author the minute i found that i they we have something called every publisher has something called the slush pile which are our manuscripts that probably would never get read um they're from unknown authors they're from people who you know people who you know, they just get put on the slush pile and 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 i picked off a guy off the slush pile a couple of years back who was absolutely brilliant, chap called Matt Cherry. Um, and he was, he was writing like Roald Dahl had met Spike Milligan. Um, and he was just a very, very original writer and a diamond in the rough because he was a carpenter by trade. Mm. And the reason why publishing reels you in is because suddenly that's, because then I, I sort of pushed Firefly to publish his first book. Um, you suddenly got their career in your hands. Right. You're, you're responsible for them. And you're, mm. and, it, and, and you do feel the weight of that responsibility. Um, it, it's quite a close, as his editor, um, I, you feel quite, a, you're, you're quite close to it, but also because- You did everything. You did the editing. Like you did, like when you say you do two days a week, you don't do any one specific thing. You do like everything. Like you're selecting, you're editing, you're- yeah, no, no, I've got, again, I've sort of narrowed that down. I'm not, I no longer sit on the submissions board. I no longer sit. Um, I'm, I'm now their commercial director. Um, yeah. And it's my job to make money outside of um, their traditional book sales in shops. So I'll look at rights deals and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, by the way, you must follow up. I, I think in my cold email to you, my follow-up email, I introduced you to Professor Noel Rosenberg, who hosts the children's literature channel on the NBN and you know he's a great guy and I, he's also got a, an online publishing platform called our books he set up for people to self-publish so I, I just think that you uh, and and he he sold a mouthwatch patent to Procter and Gamble or something he's a really interesting microbiologist in Tel Aviv and I think you'd, you'd get along so do follow up on that if you haven't yet because Definitely, he's yeah. a really yeah, yeah I, I think it, it's and I'll, I'll post a link in the show notes just for people who are listening he's he, he's he's doing an interview a week with different children's authors and publishers and things like that so do do follow up on that so so it sounds like you're working for for it, not exactly for fun rather than money but and you're obviously working you're not a sort of sit, sit back and do nothing type guy are you do you see you've got you've got the kennels you've got dogs running around you've no got that's the, that's not uh, that's then, gone now unfortunately no um we we moved to france and and 
and 10 years ago and I sort of I I sort of divested myself of a lot of the businesses so no we're down to publishing and translation um, <laughs> so you're, you're, in, you're in France right now you're in France yes. right now. yeah yeah but, okay 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 not yes. quite. So we've got so we've got we've got Portugal, Crete, and France in the room. <laughs> Basically, at the moment, none of us. <laughs> I, I was thinking to myself, next time I'm in London, I, I must try and track you down. But it sounds like that's going to be hard. <laughs> oh well, no, I'm in I'm in Henry on Thames five months of the year. So so do, no, okay. do. yeah, no, that would be that would be lovely. Mm. Um, okay. and, and, and like obviously we've been sort of jumping around a bit as we often do in these conversations but in terms of like things that you found challenging we I just tangentially referred to leadership a bit early early on in terms of you've been a salesperson doing tough door to sales so that must have helped but was there anything about managing other people that you are and you said you made lots of mistakes which is something that we certainly have in common that in terms of sort of getting other people to do their jobs well and making them work hard and inspire them. Is there anything you could share of what you found easy or what you found tough and things that would be useful for the listeners to make? Yeah. And this is quite pertinent actually, because it's the process we've been going through with Firefly because Fireflies now has, has grown a lot over the last four years. And so I found myself kind of dragging out my notes from actual translations from years ago to sort of see how we did it. So the mistakes I think I made, you know, were over delegation. Um, uh, and then, and then sort of slightly helicoptering it as well. Um, and too many meetings. Um, it, we have, at actual, we have almost no meetings. I think throughout the whole of the pandemic, we had two meetings. Um, what we do have and what I have, and I, I, I have, this works for me personally as, a, as an owner manager, is we have workflow systems set up that I can see what every member of staff is doing on a almost, not quite hourly basis, but half daily basis, say. Um, and, and so I can look at schedules and I can see where people are at with any project. So it means I don't have to have a meeting. I don't have to ask them a question. I just need to open a spreadsheet and look um, and and actually that that's good in translation because translation is potentially it's it's quite stressful as, as I'm sure you know you know it's deadline based if you make a mistake then bad things happen um, sometimes very bad things could happen if you make a mistake in translation and I would rather my job is, and it's slightly smoke and mirrors. My job is actually to go into the company, you know, and I pop in whenever I'm in Henley, the, the office is in Henley, I pop in most days. And my job is almost to sort of lighten the load, is to make jokes and to sort of be nice to people and, and, and tell them it's all right. Um, because I don't need to say, where are we at with such and such project? Because I can see, I can see where it is, you know? So I think leadership, cool. You need to have control. You need to be able to see what people are doing and you cannot take that on trust. You need to actually physically be able with your own eyes to see what people are doing and be able to monitor people. But actually then you let them go. You, let, you leave them be after that. You don't bother them. Uh, and, and that's very personal. That, that works for me. But that's also just in terms of like summarizing that you have to have some kind of automation. You obviously have some kind of automation. You have, you said you're able to track. So, you know, people have meetings because they don't know. <laughs> that, that's that, that. So like that. So that. So that, that's a good thing that you set up in your business. You set up some level of whatever automation or tracking, uh, or or visibility into the project workflow or whatever it is um, that allows you to do that. So uh, I think that's important. I think that's a. I think that's a good takeaway for somebody. I mean, like. It's great not to set up a non-meeting call. I do agree, meetings are often a waste of time. Um, and unneeded stress as well, as, you, as I guess I think that's what you're trying to say as well, is that like, why do you need to stress them out if you know what it's at and you see where it is? In fact, it sounds like you're going the opposite way. Like you're using the face-to-face -to, -face to sort of encourage them, basically. Yeah, you, you know, you turn up in the morning at 10 o'clock with the dog in tow um, and I don't know, it's just, it's a nice thing. And, and it's not, um, it, you, you still have to be strict. You still have to, but you're strict on, we, we, we very much link workflows to bonuses. And I think, again, finding a very simple bonus structure that is not, is not 
um, is not at risk of gearing or being, you know, sort of people always try and find ways around it. And so on. if it's super simple and, 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 and linking that bonus structure to, to their workflows, which is all transparent is, is yeah. again, it's, it's sort of worked for us over the years. Um, uh, as long as that bonus is achievable, uh, you know, there's nothing worse than those bonuses that you get once in a blue moon. Um, yeah, it's real and it's, and it, and it drives the behavior you want basically. Yeah, spot on. Yeah, exactly. It drives the behavior you want. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, th I think for people listening, particularly people who come from the sort of what I would say very disparaging of the cool startup culture, they think that it's very, it's very Neanderthal to have control and that's micromanagement but in fact all these controls are in place so that you don't need to micromanage you you, you and there's this concept that i i didn't say earlier but i thought of called uh, delegation by abdication that quite often entrepreneurs who can't cope with finance or sales they think i'm going to hire a rock star sales guy or an accountant and they'll take care of it and they don't learn it themselves so they don't understand what their their vp of sales or their accountant is doing and that's extremely dangerous because in this you're ultimately, as the leader, you're responsible. So if you're hand handing over to people without understanding what's going on, it's not necessarily over delegation, but it's just like crossing your fingers. And if you've got clients out there who are paying you to deliver something, saying, how do you manage this? Well, I cross my fingers. Isn't that actually, isn't that actually good enough? Um, and and what, what, about, what about your personal stress levels? Do you, do you, do you, are you quite sort of relaxed? About, you, you look relaxed, but are you internally relaxed and comfortable yeah. with all these different businesses? Um, yeah, I, that I think is something you learn. Um, you learn that I don't think anything can happen in any of the businesses that I haven't seen dozens of times before, you know, anything bad or good. Um, uh, and, and yeah, and, and that is important. It's, and, and again, that's, that's the thing, you know, that you guys are saying about, about sort of laziness. You will factor in time to be you know, just to do nothing very much, you know, factor in time just to sort of go out and walk to the garden or, you know, um, I'm trying to build a wall at the moment. Um, mm. And poorly, I might add. Um, but, but by yourself, by you're hiring people to do it or you're doing it yourself? Uh, my, son's, my son's helping me. I'm hiring <laughs> my son to help me. Um, but, you know, I think, it, again, it's a, just mixing a bit of concrete up is a nice thing to do. Um, I agree. Mm. That's, that's not nothing to do with looking at a balance mm. sheet. Um, you know, I, I, I feel we've missed, on, just thinking about it, we've missed an opportunity. You've written books about entrepreneurship and given lots of talks. So the things you haven't said, I like if someone listening thinks, well, what are the most important things that this guy Robin could share? Are the things we haven't touched on that you think are particularly important for someone? Who, people who listen are interested in leadership and entrepreneurship generally. So what haven't we heard from you that's important? I, I the, the, the best advice I ever heard, and it's totally true, was in, I, I went to some talk um, about, when I was starting the business about sort of, uh, I think it was something quite mundane about how to get um, grants or something like that. And about halfway through, this chap stood up and said, I'm really sorry, I don't want to disturb anyone, but this is not for me, um, I'm just gonna go. Um, and, and he said, I will say one thing. He said, I'm at a different, we, our business is more established and everyone else here is just starting a business. He said, we'll say one thing. When you're starting a business, everything will take twice as long to do and cost twice as much. And he said, if you, if you factor that in, you're, you're close enough for jazz. And that's, that's the best advice I can give to anyone is, is just because it's not happening doesn't mean it's not gonna happen. It's just going to take twice as long as you think. And just because you're probably a little bit poorer or a lot poorer than you were expecting after 12 months, is, that's fairly normal as well. Uh, it's, I've, I've, got, I've got such a nice example of that. An old friend of my parents in Somerset was a retired army major who bought a pig farm. There's this thing in the army where you sort of retire out of the army to do something else if you don't get promoted. And, the, the, and he was a posh sort of 
ex-public school type, sort of a bit like you, but not with the poor background um, type guy. And the Somerset farmers would lean over their heads and say, oh, it'll take 10 years. <laughs> it'll take 10 years. Said, well, in fact, they were as Radic said, it took 20. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it, it, it tends to take twice as long, no matter how long you think it's going to take. Um, that's yeah. interesting. Um, and what, what about the what about the future? I mean, you know, you're, are you am I right in thinking you're fifty six now? Is that right? Or uh, 53. 55? 53. Uh, okay, okay. So, and if you think about what you're going to be doing in the next five, to 10, 15, 20 years, where, 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 where if it goes the way you want it to go, which it probably won't, <laughs> where will it go? Um, probably, you know, the same as now. I mean, we've got um, our kids are at school in Somerset. Um, mm -hmm. so they're, they're boarding in Somerset. I know that in five years time, they'll, they'll be sort of out of our hair, so to speak. Um, uh, but I don't see taking any easier. I'd like to, I definitely, um, I'd like to see the publishing become self looking, you know, self care, caring, self sustaining or whatever, um, in the same way that the translation has done. And then I'd like to start something else. Um, you know, I'd like to go into something else. Uh, and, uh, and on to new challenges. I still like the writing. Um, I still want to do one or two books a year. Um, I probably won't, you know, um, I probably like to do something for adults now. I've been regressing, you see, I'm sort of, you know, I'm now writing for sort of six to eight year olds. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to sort of then maybe sort of go out and do something. Uh, I'd like to do something in sport maybe. Um, that's, that's right. Not what I like, I like, we like buy a football team or no, buy Chelsea. <laughs> no. or I, I, I'd like to buy a cricket team. <laughs> I don't know. You can do that even, but um, yeah, I'd like. I, I I think sport is an amazing cultural thing. I think it's an amazing unifier. Um, I, I mean, just, there are small play things you can buy ever of, of, of anything. Even yeah, I mean, I'm sure. I mean, hmm. and then I've often thought that. I've, I've often thought that croquet could be commercialised. It's got lots of bricks, and like I, 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 in my house in Poland, I've got the old croquet set from my parents' house in Somerset when you know my dad's dead, but my mum's sold up, and I've got this nice old English croquet set. Oh, from yeah. in, uh, and our little our, one of our Ukrainian guests just got this little eight-year-old, eight-year-old boy playing croquet in the garden. I was thinking, if my dad were alive, he'd love to see you know his family croquet set helping. A Ukrainian kid sort of assimilate. One of those with those tells, it, it, heavy balls as well. Does it have very heavy? Yeah, it's, it, it, the box is it's a brand called Jack that still exists, which was and it says on the labels that manufactured in 1840, 1847 or so. It's an old brilliant. And uh, but I mean, so actually, the question we often ask is about people's relationship with sport. That quite often entrepreneurs have got a competitive streak. And are, are you? Uh, do you do any sport yourself? And do you, like, if you play, do you play to win? And what, what, what's yeah. your sort of, what's your sporting heritage? My parents, my, well, not sorry, my parents, my friends, um, say I'm far too over competitive. Uh, and, and I probably am. Um, I play almost any sport poorly. Um, uh, you know, I was, I was never, you know, I never had one sport that I was sort of majorly good at and concentrated on that. Um, so I was, I was sort of always sort of, probably you know in in a sort of a you know in the seconds team for this or that or t'other um and but i i mean yesterday no sorry day before yesterday um just before the opening of the commonwealth games in birmingham um i forced the children to do this move 22 challenge um where we decided to walk up a mountain and have a penalty shootout at 2,022 meters. Oh, yeah. um, and then on the way, we played a bit of Babington, we played a bit of rugby, we did. I swam in the coldest lake imaginable. Um, and, and, and I sort of like, maybe sort of, yeah, sports charity, that kind of thing. I think that would be a very nice area to go into. And I think that would be good use of one's time um, uh, to, to do that. Um, uh, I mean, I feel like I'm 90 today i am so sort of stiff and full of pain and everything else the, 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 the wall the wall. the wall because of the wall because of the walk yeah um, <laughs> we did uh, we started off at about 800 meters and we climbed to 2300 um and uh and it was 
Oh, okay. Because of the clock, because of that, because of the. Okay. Yeah. Just, just because climbing. So the idea was, was to do, yeah, was to do, try and do as many Commonwealth sports as possible on the way up, uh, culminating in the penalty shootout at 2022 meters. Cause it was the 2022, um, uh, and you have a mountain or near you that you can do that with. Yeah, we're near the Pyrenees. Um, oh no way! So you're so we, in the, you're in the south. Okay. Yeah, we're in the south France. So so yeah, the Pyrenees is our local. And there's a mountain called Montague, which just looks just like a child would draw a mountain. It looks like a mini Everest. Um, when I was a kid, I went to a place called Bagnet de Bigot. I don't know. If <gasps> that's where we were. <laughs> Are you serious? No Literally. way. So so Bagnet de Bigot. That's crazy. That's literally crazy. I was in a camp there. Uh, they left me when I was like third. Well, how old was I? Like thirteen or fourteen years old. As a kid there, like a language school or something like that, and we were all drinking and partying, and it was a total. It was hilarious. That was back in the eighties. That's in the eighties. That's a long time ago. But uh, hey, well, that was it. You're, but that's exactly where. So we went through Banya de Bigor, and about five clicks on from there. You start so you live up. somewhere near Toulouse? Do you live somewhere near Toulouse? Where do you no, live? we live, so we live, actually, we live about 40, 50 minutes drive from Bagnères. Uh, okay. so po is our nearest sort of big conurbation. Oh, okay. So we live. That's yeah. so crazy. It's like, I know no place in the Pyrenees. That's the only <laughs> name I know in the Pyrenees. I like know nothing about that. Fantastic. I'll, 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 we'll, put it, we'll put a pin in the show notes. Just for <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look up, look up Montaigu. Um, it, okay. It's just a great mountain to climb because you look at yeah. it and you go, I need to climb that because it's just a pointed mountain. That's crazy. Mm. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, that was fun. So yeah, sports maybe. Who knows? Like you say, no, nothing ever goes to plan, does it? Yeah. Well, it's been a, it's been a great conversation. I know we normally have about an hour, we slight, slightly overrun, but normally I hand over to uh, Kimon, Kimon to wrap. Is there any last thing you'd like to say to people before Kimon does the sort of formal summing up? No, no, uh, that was absolute blast. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know about the formal summing up anymore, Richard. I think we're just going to go with um, Robin. Thank you for the time. It's uh, it's been no really interesting. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm amazed at how much we have in common. Uh, we haven't talked. No. I mean, I didn't, obviously it's your thing, so I didn't want to talk about. It. But like, I feel like I have like a ton in common with you. Just I, I ended up setting up a translation business, but just the crazy like the door to door sales stuff and all that. But I think that there's just like tons of good lessons. And I, what I find like most interesting is that you're just ready to keep going. Like you're like you're like we're also the same age. I'm not saying that I'm not going to keep going like doing new stuff, but I feel like you're a little bit more like you have like ideas, stuff that you want to like you've got like undone, like you got a you got something in the you got the sports team thing. You've got something in the. You definitely have the energy, and you want to keep doing stuff. And I think that's that's awesome. I think that's what I think that's awesome, basically. Lost it, lost. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. but anyway, I've I really enjoyed that. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot, and uh, good luck with everything. Yeah, you too, guys.